Uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to today's Elihu Katz Colloquium. Um, for those of you who are new to this colloquium series, it's named in honor of Elihu Katz, our beloved colleague who uh, recently uh, switched to emeritus status. I won't, I won't call him retired because I don't think that Elihu is capable of that. Uh, today's speaker is from Annenberg. This speaker series includes both outside speakers and our own faculty. So I'm pleased to be able to introduce Deborah Moeller, uh, Assistant Professor of Communication, who's been here at Annenberg since 2009 and came to us from Cornell University. She also holds a secondary appointment in political science, where I also spend some time. Uh, her research is focused on political communication, but in some pretty unique contexts, because uh, Devra also has a strong background in comparative politics and particularly in African politics. What I personally find very exciting about Devra's research and, and unique is that she has really taken field experiments uh, where they haven't gone before, and that is she's done field experimental work in contexts where it's very difficult to do that, in very complex field situations where it's not at all easy to do. Uh, she recently completed uh, a field experiment on partisan media effects in Ghana, where, which she'll be talking about today. Uh, this work, a paper based on some of this work just this August, received the Best Paper Award from the experimental section of the American Political Science Association. So without further ado, Devra. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much. This is a real treat. Um, uh, I'm excited to present to you, both because this is a fabulous new room we're in, um, and also because this is a work in progress, and so I'm very excited to get your feedback and comments on it. Um, so um, I'm going to talk today about partisan media in, as Diana said, a context in which uh, not much research has been done. Um, there's a uh, in the last several decades, there was just this explosion of private media sources in countries in Africa, Eastern Europe, Latin America, Asia, where government monopolies had dominated for decades. And following some political and economic liberalizations, leaders first lifted some restrictions on the print media, um, but weren't, and they still tried to maintain control over the broadcast media, given that in most of these developing countries, radio was the primary source of news and still is the primary source of news. But eventually, even uh, the restrictions on broadcast media were lifted in all but really the most authoritarian countries throughout the world now have a diverse array of private media. So just to give you an example of that in the country I'm going to focus on, uh, if you turned on your radio or your TV prior to 1992, this was your one, your only choice of Ghanaian media, the government-owned uh, Ghana Broadcasting Corporation. So everything that people got that was domestic media came from uh, the state. Fast forward to today, there are 225 different FM radio stations in Ghana. 40 in just the greater Accra area, the capital city alone, has 40 different stations. Most of these stations are private. Many of them contain uh, political content. Political content is actually quite popular. Um, and of those that provide political contact, content, the majority of them are partisan. They are strongly aligned with either political parties or groups. And so my talk here really today is a beginning to try and answer the question about what's the effect of these partisan media sources on newly liberalized countries. When I use the term newly liberalized, I mean both new democracies, some of these countries that have gone economic, political, and, li and media liberalizations that have reached a certain level of political uh, freedom. Um, but I'm also referring here to countries that have gone through some liberalization, uh, especially media liberalization, but that still w are what we would call competitive authoritarian countries or hybrid polities that combine elements of both authoritarian and democratic traits. So what's the effect of these partisan media in these uh, uh, settings? Well, the conventional view is really quite dismal. So, Here's a particularly provocative statement by Samantha Power, 
At the time, she was a professor at Harvard, and she won. Uh, she wrote uh, at the same time a Pulitzer Prize-winning book on the Rwandan genocide, and she has since become probably one of our most foremost public intellectuals on human rights issues. And she wrote, killers in Rwanda often carried a machete in one hand and a radio transmitter in the other. So she's referring to the RTLM radio, which was uh, often called genocidal radio. It was the first private radio station that was set up following media liberalization in Rwanda. So it's exactly the kind of station that we're talking about. And uh, if I've ever seen a statement of massive media effects, this is one, right? Um, the media had this direct effect that led to extreme attitudes and led people to commit the most extreme action possible, killing their fellow neighbors. Um, so, uh, more generally, this is really an extreme case of violence. Um, and this is a particularly striking statement of the strength of media. Um, but it's actually not that unusual in discussions of the effects of private media or of media generally in developing countries. Um, so uh, there is this notion that the private, private media is going to lead to uh, extreme divisions, um, that strong partisan attitudes or ethnic attitudes, that it's going to undermine democratic attitudes, it's going to uh, destroy people's, uh, the legitimacy of, of fledgling democratic institutions, and that it's going to lead to violence. And over and over again in both writings um, by academics, by policymakers, and, and talking to people, you hear them making reference to these very extreme cases where uh, really uh, uh, hate speech and radio coincided with violence and drawing the conclusions that one led to the other, and furthermore, that that's an example of what's going to happen to us. So really, really strong, negative, dismal um, uh, expectations of the outcomes of these private media sources. Um, to a lesser degree, often much lesser degree, you hear the same concerns expressed about the uh, role of providers and media in our own country and in other established democracies. So a quote by Cass Sunstein here, um, not coincidentally, perhaps, married to Samantha Power. Um, <laughs> so he's uh, the foremost public intellectual, I would say, who's commenting on the new media system and the growth of partisan media in the United States that makes uh, uh, predictions about its negative effects. And again, you hear this notion that partisan media is going to lead to polarization. It's going to um, undermine democratic attitudes, lead to extremism, and, and mobilize those extremists. So what's the research on partisan media effects? Well, uh, it's uh, almost entirely in the United States and to some degree now in Europe. And I'm going to grossly overgeneralize the literature, which is really a quite um, rich and varied literature. But to summarize bluntly, there is a, a fair amount of evidence now that partisan media leads to polarization along a number of dimensions that it undermines democratic attitudes. For example, um, Lewandowski's found that it leads people to be less willing to compromise. Um, it spreads information. So Andrew, Laura, and I have found that people exposed to partisan media develop uh, inflated expectations that their own side is going to win the election by a lot. Um, and when those expectations are not met, those who are consuming partisan media, um, they end up with uh, uh, a perceived legitimacy of the government institutions as being lowered and of media institutions. And finally, um, uh, Doug and I have found that uh, partisan media increases participation. Uh, these sites are, uh, I chose one per uh, outcome, but there's actually many more to go along with these. And of course, the first four seem to be normatively problematic. The fifth, more ambiguous, participation we generally think of as good, but if it's participation by extremists, um, that might be problematic. Um, so what about research on media effects in new newly liberalized polities? Um, for the most part, a blank slate. There's been almost nothing done on partisan media specifically, and uh, I would say nothing that really gives us a lot of causal leverage over cause and effect. Um, so. Yet, I think that this is an incredibly important area of research. 
So for three reasons. One, I think studying partisan media in a very different context can inform our theories of partisan media that we're employing even here. And I'll talk some about how my research, um, uh, I think, does that. Um, and then second, partisan media consumption is widespread. Most of the people, most of the time, in most places are consuming partisan media in post-liberalization settings. That's a big difference from uh, in our own country where it's still a minority of people who are consuming pri primarily or exclusively partisan media. So it's sort of the flip numbers in terms of what people are consuming. And finally, uh, media effects can be especially consequential when democratic institutions are weak. So polarization, um, uh, attitudes about democracy and democratic institutions might be especially important um, in these fragile states or in fragile democracies. Um, and really, um, what really motivated actually both my co-author and I was that when we were doing our previous research, we would talk to democracy activists. These were people who had often risked their lives during authoritarian regimes to bring about democratic change and were continuing in many ways to devote themselves to democratic uh, development and good governance, often working for NGOs. And many of them expressed the view that the potential of partisan media leading to democratic collapse and uh, uh, divisions that would uh, undermine the social fabric of the society, that these dangers were so great that it might be time to consider censorship of the media, restriction of licenses, um, a sanctioning of those who are taking these extreme partisan views and so on. So you have uh, democracy, democracy, Democrats with a small d, um, thinking about that it might be a good thing to censor the media, government censorship of media. And in many ways, actually, this contradiction was not lost on them at all. It was just that the threat of partisan media was perceived to be so great. And in these discussions, Rwanda, Kenya, almost always brought up as the example of what's going to happen to them. Um, okay, so really important, and yet we have virtually no evidence to back up these very worried claims. So my co-author Jeff Conroy Kratz and I decided to do a field experiment on partisan media in a new democracy. Our main research question, how do partisan media affect political attitudes and behavior in a newly liberalized country? Now we're going to look at five outcomes. Um, today, I'm going to focus primarily on the first two. I should say I have papers under review on the first three, um, and the last two are, uh, I've got some very preliminary research, and I'm hoping uh, to hear back from you guys to do some more. Um, but uh, I'm going to focus mainly on one and two and touch a little bit on three and four and probably not have time to get to five. So the case that we're looking at is Ghana. Ghana is a new democracy, um, so it has reached the basic threshold of media and, uh, uh, sorry, political and civil liberties. It has two main parties. The democratic transition, the first mostly free and fair election, came in 1992. And since then, the two main parties have alternated power. There have been two turnovers. Um, logistically, this was useful for us because there's a fairly even split between the two parties and because uh, partisanship doesn't overlap completely with ethnicity. For some ethnic groups, there's a strong overlap, but not for all. Um, and then also the election was uh, timed in a way that we could do this prior to the election. Um, so, so, uh, but it's also a case of where partisan media is strongly aligned with the two political parties. So anyway, it fit the kind of case we wanted, and logistically it, it worked for us is why we chose Ghana. Um, so, in addition to the sort of innovation of this as being uh, taking partisan media research to a new location, a new type of setting, we also have a, a methodological innovation. We thought that the types of methods being used to study partisan media were likely to lead to exaggerated estimations of the effects of partisan media. So, the um, potential of confusing um, uh, selective exposure with media effects is well known in terms of survey research, but we also thought that labs may also be exaggerating the effects of partisan media, 
Because in the lab setting, people are likely to be more attentive to the partisan cues on the media and more attentive to the biased content. And so they're more likely to react in ways um, that are towards the partisan biases of the media um, than in real life, where people are consuming media often in a casual way amidst Miriam distractions um, or just not paying attention at all if they don't want to. Um, so we wanted to expose people to partisan media in a way that they wouldn't know they were being exposed um, at all, that they wouldn't know they were in, an, in a, a study, and where they would be consuming it in an environment such as they normally consume it. So what we did was we made use of a captive population traveling in trotros. Um, so trotros are minibuses. Um, they're the main form of transportation in Ghana and actually in much of the developing world, these minivans. Um, and they are privately owned, but they function essentially like public transportation systems here. So people board the, tra the trotros at a station. They follow regular routes, often picking up people or sometimes picking up people and dropping them off at bus stops. Um, and the passengers uh, don't know the driver. They don't know the other passengers unless they arrive together as a group. I mean, unless they were you know, friends that are boarded together, they wouldn't know each other. Um, and so they're essentially, you can just think about it as uh, if you got on a city bus here in Philadelphia and the radio is playing loud so that everybody can hear it. Um, usually people listen to whatever it is that the driver chooses to play. In this case, we just told the driver what to play and we randomized what radio station we told them to play. Um, these are uh, essentially their mini buses imported from wealthy countries stripped of their interiors and re-outfitted so that they can fit, in this case, 15 people. So you're literally trapped in a tin can with little else to do but listen to the radio. As I found out on my many, many, many Trotro rides and planning for this. Um, we have four conditions. The first one is a pro-government radio. The second is a pro-opposition radio. The third is a neutral radio station, and the fourth is a no government, uh, sorry, a no radio control. So they just didn't play any radio station in the fourth. Um, we played, uh, we did this with talk radio shows. These are not specifically political talk radio, but we did it in the month before the election, um, gambling that there would be a lot of political contact, uh, context. Fortunately, we were right for our findings. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it's the talk shows that people most identified as being the dangerous elements within the partisan radio spectrum. So it's the sort of editorial freewheeling discussions. Um, you also have callers uh, calling in. They read uh, emails and text messages as well. So it's, uh, they have guests come in and they hold discussions basically. Um, so uh, these are sort of the ones that are people identified as uh, the most partisan, the most potentially dangerous. I'm not going to go into this, um, but uh, we have a fair amount of evidence that our partisan stations are indeed strongly partisan and our neutral station is not. All the experts we talked to were in total agreement about which were the most partisan stations and which were the most popular partisan stations. There was really no challenge in picking our two partisan stations. Um, our neutral station, initially we chose one that was too highbrow. We're told this would never be played on a trotro, and so we went a little lowbrow, um, but still it's neutral. There was also an independent content analysis done by the uh, National Media Commission of news content during this time. Hugely skewed context, uh, content in the two partisan stations, and neutral in the neutral one. And finally, our respondents correctly identified the bias of the stations. Okay. So uh, what we did was we had a research assistant meet a bus driver and arrange with them to be a confederate. Most of them we had planned ahead of time, but um, some got arranged on the spot um, for a small fee. Uh, they boarded the Trotro along with all the other passengers, a research assistant, and they rode uh, in the Trotro for the duration of the trip. And as they neared what would be the likely endpoint, they stood up and announced that we were conducting a, that, uh, a survey on the transportation system and other issues of importance to Ghanaians. And if people wanted to participate for a small uh, fee, sorry, small payment, um, <laughs> they should stick around um, and, uh, and somebody would be there to meet them. 
Um, so we then, uh, they would text ahead to our research team who would run, and I mean run, to wherever it was people were getting off the trotro. It was never the same place because it depended on when the traffic started backing up, people would get off. They never went to the final station, unfortunately. Anyway. We worked with 57 different Trotro routes. These tended to be busier routes because we needed ones with a lot of traffic. Um, we altered our routes each day so that there wouldn't be contamination from one day to the next. We worked with 228 different drivers over the course of 15 days. We chose routes where we thought there would be a 40 minute um, ride or more so there would be enough of a dosage. We did these uh, between the hours of six and 10 I'm not a morning person, so that was tough, but it was the only time that all three stations were playing these political talk shows. Um, and the broadcasts were in Twi, which was the lingua franca of Ghana, primarily in Twi. 88% of our subjects said they understood Twi. Um, we managed to get uh, 1,200 responses. Um, and, okay, turning to the first outcome. Uh, partisan polarization or moderation. And here we're looking at the extremity of partisan attitudes and behaviors. Um, this is probably the topic that's received the most attention within the literature on partisan media uh, here in the US. Uh, before I move on, just a few terms. When I talk about moderation, I mean a decrease in attitude extremity. It's the opposite of polarization. I will at no time during this talk refer to moderation as a interaction term or subpopulation differences. So put that technical term in the back. I'm using the more colloquial form of moderation as uh, less extreme attitudes. Like-minded media is when media is slanted towards an individual's predispositions. So in the US case, this would be Democrats listening to MSNBC, for example. Uh, Cross-cutting media is listening to media slanted against your, pro uh, your predispositions. In the US context, this would be Republicans listening, uh, sorry, Democrats listening to Fox News. Okay, so what's the theory about how we think part partisan media should affect partisan attitude strength? Well, the conventional view within the study of partisan media is that it polarizes. Why? Individuals accept arguments from like-minded media, but they dismiss or argue against uh, arguments from cross-cutting media. So essentially they get pushed further in the direction that they already believe from hearing their own side and either they just ignore the other side or they argue against it which could also lead to more extreme views uh, in line with their own. Um, but we argue that this isn't the only way that people might react to partisan media. In fact, you might get the opposite effect. So partisan media can also moderate since novel arguments from cross-cutting media could be more persuasive than familiar arguments from like-minded media. The second view of thinking about exposure to a diversity of viewpoints is, of course, a staple, a long-standing tradition in democratic theory, the idea that exposure to a diversity of views is healthy for, to, for democracy because it leads to greater understanding and less extreme views. And it's also been uh, played a fairly heavy role in literature on interpersonal communication and deliberation. But it's been very, given very little attention within the literature on partisan media. Um, so we really um, bring that to the table. Um, and we argue that the prime difference between whether you're going to get polarization or moderati moderation has to do with whether or not the people are partisan motivated reasoners or engaging in part of partisan motivated reasoning. So when you are strongly partisan and you're looking for views that confirm your partisan predispositions, you're going to polarize. However, if you have uh, accuracy goals in mind, then the information that is most novel that helps you to update your, um, your uh, ideas is going to be the most influential. So you're more likely to moderate in response to hearing the other side. And furthermore, our main contribution is that we argue in newly liberalized polities, low political sophistication and shifting political landscapes discourage partisan motivated reasoning. So how does that go? Parties are fairly new. Individuals, part uh, partisan leaders are switching parties fairly frequently. Parties are coming and going. People have had no chance to get sort of um, uh, socialized 
into a partisan identity, and they tend to be fairly weak. So they don't have the inclination to, tr to try and uh, make sure that their side is correct or to bolster their side. Secondly, they just don't have the tools. So uh, experience with multi-party democracy is new. They often don't have a lot of information that will allow them to beef up on the arguments. And so they have limited ability to sort of counter argue to, argue, uh, to mount arguments against the other side. And so they're just more likely to accept rather than refute the discordant messages. And so we expect in most newly liberalized polities, partisan media will moderate partisan attitudes. How are we going to measure this? Um, we have our three treatments, which were um, government radio, opposition radio, and neutral radio. We transform the first two into like-minded radio and cross-cutting radio. So for example, if you're a government supporter listening to government radio, you would be coded as like-minded. If you're a government supporter listening to the opposition radio, you would be coded as cross-cutting. Of course, to do this, we need a measure of people's partisan predispositions. And the kicker here is that we couldn't do a pretest because it would uh, destroy the wonderful external validity that we have with this experiment. Essentially, it would alert people to the fact that they're in a study and then that has something to do with politics. So we had to rely on a post-treatment measure. What we did was we chose to rely on how people said they voted in the previous election. The idea here being that people would be less likely to be caused by the treatment to misreport past behavior. And indeed, these, uh, the reporting is totally balanced across the different treatment groups. And I can talk about this later, but the results we get are highly unlikely to be due to um, the miscoding of partisanship. It just, the logical, the, yeah, it just logically doesn't make sense how you would get those results based on the coding. Um, and I can talk about that more later. But initially, uh, we agonized over this a great deal. In the end, I think we, um, we got it right. I don't think it's a big problem here. And in each case, we're going to compare these treatments to the no radio condition. Um, but And also, it means that we're only considering people who've said they voted for a major party in the last election. So we're only looking at partisans here. The outcome variables, we have uh, two um, that are based on survey responses and one behavioral measure. So we actually have five in our paper, but I'm going to focus on three of them. The first one is your attitudes about your own candidate minus your attitudes about the other candidate. So we asked six questions, three about the government candidates, whether or not they were trustworthy, strong, and capable of bringing development. We asked the same thing about the opposition, and it's basically the party that you said you voted for minus the other party. Um, and so this is really a gap between how much you like your side versus the other. More positive attitudes means that there's a larger gap, that you have more extreme preferences for your party over the other. Smaller um, numbers means that you like them both similarly. The second is a question we asked about, is there any, is there any party that you would vote never, sorry, <laughs> Is there a party that you would never vote for under any circumstances? And if they named the, opposite, the other party, interesting. Technical advice. <laughs> you guys have it right. Oh, it's back. Um, <laughs> if they named the other party, then they got a one. If they didn't name the other party, they got a zero. So basically, if you said, I can never conceive of voting for X party, that's not my own. Then you get, uh, then you're counted, counted as having more extreme partisan attitudes in line with your predispositions. And then the last was a behavioral measure of whether or not you're more likely to want to display your partisan identity or your national identity. So here's how it goes. At the end of the survey, we offered people a token of our gratitude. We presented them with three keychains that they could take one of them home with them. Two of them are the party color symbols and names. And the middle one is the Ghanaian flag with Ghana written on it. So we essentially record as high partisan attitudes if they chose a partisan keychain of their own, and low as if they chose the Ghanaian flag. And our results. So we find no effect of like-minded media on any of these outcomes. We find a negative effect of cross-cutting media on these outcomes. So let me specify. Uh, high values 
means that the treatment group had more extreme attitudes than the no radio control group. Negative numbers here means that the treatment group had less extreme attitudes than the no uh, radio control. So essentially it's saying that um, compared to hearing nothing at all, these people have become less extreme in their attitudes. And we find no effect of uh, the neutral media. So um, all we find is that cross-cutting media leads to moderation. So partisan media called moderation of partisan attitudes and increased displays of national over partisan identity. What are the implications? Uh, the dominant perspective predicts polarization um, because they assume partisan motivated reasoning. Um, and we think that might be, uh, in some ways, an artifact of the country that has received the most attention, the United States. Um, the opposite should be expected when partisan motivated re reasoning is low. And we think that the conditions in Ghana specifically and more generally in most lib newly liberalized uh, countries would uh, discourage partisan motivated reasoning. So there's weak partisan identity, people are open to cross-cutting media, and low political sophistication. And just sort of an additional note, um, uh, we have evidence that partisanship identity um, from other surveys is really very low in Ghana and in Africa generally. Less than 1% of people I name it as their primary identity other than their national identity. Um, and we also subdivide our sample into low and high sophisticates. So we have some knowledge battery of questions and we divide them at the mean and we only get the significant results among the low sophisticates. Um, so again, it seems that people who are not that able to mount or counter arguments um, are more likely to have this moderating effect. The interaction term isn't significant, so I don't want to make too much of that, but it's suggestive. And more generally, thinking back again to the larger literature on partisan media, primarily in established democracies, we, I think we should expect variation in how partisan media affect attitude extremity according to whether partisan environments and individual traits foster or discourage partisan motivated reasoning. So it's really time now, I think, that this literature on partisan media has a certain amount of uh, gravitas and has done a lot, uh, accumulated some evidence that we start looking at variation that might be important in when and among whom. Okay, second outcome, mobilization or demobilization. Here we look at interest and participation and we separate out these two. A lot of times people look at it as engagement as a composite of both interest and action. Um, we thought it important theoretically to distinguish between the two and I'll tell you why. Um, so one way in which media might affect participation is by increasing interest in politics. So this comes from a large literature on just looking at media on, on participation generally. The basic notion, you're exposed to political conversation that makes you more interested in politics and more likely to get involved. Um, uh, thanks to Diana, we have uh, another uh, expectation here, which is that exposure to political discussion might affect your attitude strength, and it might be attitude strength that affects participation. So uh, she did this within interpersonal discussions, but in many ways the th same thing might hold for media. And under this second logic, given that our cross-cutting media led to less extreme attitudes, we would expect a reduced participation only among those exposed to cross-cutting media. Our outcomes, our causes are the same. Our outcomes is an interest scale, um, a sum of question about interest and incitement in politics and campaigns. Um, the second is a, a measure of participation, is another behavioral measure. Um, we, at the end of the survey, we asked people what their major concerns were with the transportation system. We then told them that we were compiling a petition to the political parties, telling, people about, uh, uh, telling them about your main concerns. We were going to send you a text message later, and if you want to sign the petition to political parties, text back yes. And so later that day or the next day or the day after that, we sent them this text message, and we record as, the, as participation those who text back yes. Um, versus those who did not. Um, we like this for several reasons. One, it clearly separates out interest from participation. We felt that a um, uh, survey question about whether or not you intend to participate might be really highly influenced by whether or not you are excited and interested, right? So yes, I'm excited and I'm interested, and yes, I'm gonna get involved. 
um, which might not actually translate into real participation, so we like the measure of real participation. Secondly, there's a slight time lag. Rarely are people exposed to media and asked immediately following to get involved, and so um, this is definitely not a long-term lag, but it's at least some of a lag. It also takes place not under the watchful eye of the uh, researcher, so there's less desire of social desirability bias to respond. And finally, people actually had to pay to send the text back and had to exert some effort, which looks a little bit more like real participation. And uh, yes, we did indeed uh, take into account that people pay to do this, and we delivered our, uh, our petitions duly to the political parties. Um, what are the results? Uh, we get uh, across the board increases in interest and excitement about politics, regardless of the political slant of the programming. But we only get a decline in participation um, from cross-cutting media. So those exposed to media from the other side were less likely to sign the petition to the political parties. So all types of, of discussion increase interest, but interest does not seem to spawn political action. Cross-cutting media actually led to a decrease in participation, even though it led to an increase in interest. And it seems like attitude strength rather than interest is what's driving political action. Uh, OK, very quickly. Um, the third topic is norms about electoral malfeasance. So accusations of malpractice are very common in media and post-liberalization settings. It's often presented in uh, a very sensationalist manner and amidst a campaign coverage that emphasizes really the competitive nature of elections. And of course, part of this large reporting of malfeasance might be because there is a lot of malfeasance. But most often, it's hugely exaggerated because things that are just rumors, insinuations, are often reported as fact. Um, resources for fact-checking are low, professional norms are different, and uh, uh, training is different as well. Um, and so you get these sort of trading of accusations, uh, often in the politician's interest to make these accusations, and so you get it back and forth, often in very sensationalized terms, without any corrections ever. Um, and uh, we expect that this repeated exposure to claims that malfeasance is going on is going to increase expectations of malpractice, so affect descriptive norms, saying it's very common. We also think it might affect people's acceptance of that malpractice. So part of it is you hear it over and over, and it becomes normalized. You think everybody's doing it. It might not be that bad. But even aside from this, uh, the, the first sort of descriptive norms, it might also have an effect to the extent that it privileges other norms or other goals. So it may be that you hear about everybody's getting largesse, for their families and their communities, except for you. And that's a value. Providing for your family and community is also a value that people hold very dearly, so that might elevate it. It may be that you have a norm of fairness, but hearing about the other guy perpetrating these and the electoral commission or the judicial system not being able to deal with it makes it seem like the fair thing to do is to counter this uh, uh, these uh, malpractices by the other side, rather than not engaging in them at all. Um, so uh, both through descriptive norms, but aside from that, we expect that it also increases acceptance of malpractice. Um, we're going to look here at the main effects, all the radio treatments together. I can talk about that more in question and answer if you want. The outcomes are three measures. The first is a scale based on questions about whether or not you expect ballot stuffing, vote buying, uh, hate speech, spreading of lies, intimidation, and violence. The second one is a single question about how free and fair you expect the election to be. And the last one is similar to the first, except that it acts about how acceptable it is for your side to engage in ballot stuffing, uh, vote buying, et cetera, and violence under certain circumstances. Uh, I can't share the results with you. I'm on, uh, in the strange position of having submitted to a special issue of comparative political studies. Uh, they had us submit papers with all of the results extracted so that they would make decisions solely on the quality of the theory and research design, which means that we are 
uh, instructed not to make our results available in any way, shape, or form until we are accepted or rejected from this uh, group. So, moving on. <laughs> Uh, the last one is about social group polarization. So it may be that part of that partisan attitudes are weak, but other identity categories are strong, and it may be that you get polarization along those other lines. In this case, we're going to look at ethnic discrimination. And indeed, the radio stations have uh, affiliations with an ethnic group each. So for example, one of the radio stations is associated um, with the EVE group. They use the lingua franca, TUI, for most of their broadcasts, but they pepper it with EVE language, every word. And they also have one guy who's sort of the comedian, the, the, the jester um, in the studio, but his other main function is to sort of periodically summarize what the argument is in EVE or to add more EVE commentating, um, both as a way to keep the EVE on board with the talk, but I think more importantly to sort of signal, signal their ethnic attachments. Um, and the stations are, they're known for having these ethnic affiliations. So the theory is pretty much the same as the partisan media one. Um, if people are ethnic motivated reasoners, they will polarize. If they are not ethnic motivated reasoners, they will moderate. Um, and we may find moderation in the partisan case, but not in the ethnic case to the extent that this is the salient uh, identity. Um, we have, we recode the causal variables to be whether or not the, your own ethnicity matches the ethnicity of the radio station affiliation um, or not. And then of course peace is the one that's not uh, affiliated with either ethnic group. The outcome is our third behavioral measure and it's whether or not you donate different, differently at different rates to ethnically identified orphans. So here's how it goes. Um, at the end, we paid people their reward in small change. We then asked them immediately after whether or not they would like to donate to SOS Children's Village in Tema, an organization that provides for orphans. And embedded in this uh, asking for donations was a sentence that described an example orphan. Um, they provide shelter, food, care, and education for an eight-year-old boy in class three from the Akan group who could no longer be cared for for his family. So Akan and Eve are the two main ethnic groups that are associated with the radio, and we randomized whether or not they got Akan inserted there or Eve inserted in there. And we're gonna look at whether or not being in a treatment group get, makes you more likely to donate whether or not the individuals in that treatment group are more likely to donate to one ethnic group or the other. Uh, what's the time? I'm not gonna do into that. The only thing to say is that initially our look at polarization recoded people to say whether or not they were more extreme in their partisan attitudes. Um, that could, that moderation could be because you become more fond of the other side or it could be because you become less enchanted with your own side. So it could be an overall increase in your support for politicians and institutions, or it could be a cynicism, a sort of everybody's bad kind of a thing. Um, and so uh, the last one is to look at main effects to, to um, pull that apart. And summary. So the theoretical implications, the dominant perspective on partisan media, and I should say the popular conventional view within Africa, is that um, the, there's motivated reasoning um, and that there are, there's information saturation, essentially. Um, and instead, we think the condition in most newly liberalized countries discourage partisan motivated reasoning and that there's limited information access, especially to views from the other side. And so people should be especially uh, influenced by the novel views they, saw, they hear from media from the other side. Um, and less influenced by arguments that are, because of the uh, fairly homogeneous social settings um, and social networks, um, they've heard it all before, essentially, from like-minded media. Uh, the cross-cutting media is new and novel and interesting and uh, acceptable. Um, we also, we think, make a methodological contribution in presenting an alternative approach that doesn't uh, have the risks of inflating um, the partisan media effects because we introduce it in a way uh, that subjects, uh, that's 
uh, subjects were not aware of it and it was in a normal setting. And thinking about generalizability. So here, of course, I'm going out on a limb um, based on our theory um, and our findings from this case. We would expect the same effects in most newly, newly liberalized polities. So we expect partisan media to reduce the extremity of partisan attitudes, depress participation, generate interest in most newly liberalized polities. Why? Because most of these uh, countries also have weak partisanship, low political knowledge, and views on cross-cutting media are novel. So we think that those conditions that we found in Ghana are actually generalizable, and to all extent and purposes, to the extent that we have data on partisanship, knowledge, et cetera, that is the case. Um, we're not, sh we don't necessarily think that the moderating effect that we found for partisan media is going to extend to other salient identity categories. And most importantly, I think, we think that this moderating effect is not going to extend to places where there are already extreme political divisions. So in places like Rwanda and Kenya, where partisan divisions have been reified and coincide almost completely with ethnic divisions, and those are extremely salient in people's minds, we would expect polarization rather than moderation. So unfortunately, in the places that are most in need of moderation, we do not expect these valuable effects. Um, a massive thanks to our research team. This was a logistical nightmare of an experiment, and they went way above and beyond the call of duty. And I thank you to our funders here at Annenberg and also the media action um, at BBC. And thank you.